The following, the following interview was conducted with Vincent P. Dronovic, professor of civil engineering and former head of the school for the, uh, from 1991 to 2000 for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Wednesday, May 19, 2010 in Stewart Center 263. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Library. Good afternoon, Professor Dunn. Thank afternoon. you very much. <laughs> okay. okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, tell us where and when you were born and your parents in the early years. Okay, um, I was born um, on uh, August the 6th, 1940 in Wilkinsburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, our family lived uh, in, first of all, in West Wilmerding, Pennsylvania. Wilmerding is uh, a uh, community associated with the Westinghouse air break, and Wilmerding was uh, George Westinghouse's uh, wife's maiden name. So that's why the community was named Wilmerding. Uh, we lived there for about uh, four years and then moved up on top of the hill to what is known as East McKeesport or North Versailles, Pennsylvania. And um, lived there and the family home still exists. Uh, a nephew now owns the home, but uh, so it's Very nice. got a long history of, of the family there. Uh, I'm the oldest of ten children and that uh, was a, a very interesting uh, family in childhood. I'm uh, 23 years older than my youngest brother, uh, and so there's quite a span in ages there. There's six boys and, and four girls, um, and the uh, since I was the first, I uh, learned about children and taking care of children, <laughs> a bunch of other things. My grandfather and my father were in the construction business, uh, uh, somewhat separately uh, and so at an early age I learned about construction and uh, operating equipment and doing things of that nature so uh, by the time I was in my mid-teens I basically had my own crew and was involved in construction uh, doing various kinds of uh, small residential uh, commercial and industrial kinds of uh, jobs and uh, thought that that's where my career was going to be okay uh, I went through public school for the first five years and then transferred uh, to sixth grade to uh, a Catholic school, which was St. Aloysius, is now renamed St. Jude's, and they had no school. The school's gone. Uh, then uh, I went to uh, St. Peter's High School in Keysport, Pennsylvania, uh, and that was uh, the only Catholic high school probably within... 15 miles of the, our, our, where we lived, uh, and graduated from there in 1958. I had intentions of uh, going back, with, working with my father and grandfather in construction, and had no intentions of going to uh, college. Uh, the fate <laughs> has different uh, things. And, uh, our high school was... Uh, and 12 was grades. It all boys or was no, it co-ed? Co-ed, okay. 12 grades, one building, and we had no cafeteria, no gym, uh, no sports, uh, and uh, well, no laboratories. Club, no clubs? No laboratories? No, and uh, the closest thing we had to a club was the debate club or things that like that. That seems to be an interesting, there are many others I've talked to, the debate seemed to have been very popular right. in high school. <laughs> right, yeah. 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 So, um, I was uh, in my senior year, in fact it was like in January of my senior year, and, and did nothing uh, towards uh, considering college at all, and I had uh, a nun teacher, homeroom teacher, whose name was Sister Eugenia, and she says, you really ought to go to college, you really ought to go to college. And so uh, I uh, thought about it, and I found an ad in Popular Science Magazine, a little small ad that said, uh, Bachelor's degree in civil engineering, 27 months uh, at Tri-State College in Angola, Indiana. And I said, well, that 27 months is nothing. I could uh, get that degree and go back and work with dad and grandfather. Well, I showed the ad to the nun, and she said, well, I guess that would be okay, but you really ought to take a look at the school first. And so, uh, and she says, uh, you know, that's in Indiana, and I have a nun friend who is doing graduate work at Notre Dame. Uh, I borrowed these two books from her last year. Would you mind returning these books? 
<laughs> as long as you're in, as long as you're there, right? As long as you're there. You're in the neighborhood. Okay, so, so this was mid-February. Uh, my dad and I got in the car and we drove to Angola, Indiana, and uh, talked to the uh, people there. And I hadn't applied there either, and so I, uh, and that's the only place I had considered, and I wanted to to visit there. And so at the end of the uh, visit, they said, uh, "Would you like to come here in September?" And I said, uh, "Yeah, I guess so." And so I filled out the paperwork, and then uh, we got in the car, and it was like a late Friday afternoon, and looked and found that South Bend is another 90 miles down the road, which we did not anticipate. And so we got in the car and drove, and as we're uh, going up Notre Dame Avenue, my father sees uh, the blessed mother on the dome and he says you're going to school here <laughs> that was all there was to it. it yeah so anyhow the golden dome is what did it right that's right so we went to the huddle which is a snack bar at notre dame and we're talking with some students and uh, my dad introduced me and said uh, my son vince he's going to go to school here and they said fine he says but how do you know that they haven't announced any acceptances yet and uh, he, my dad says, well, we haven't applied yet. And the student said, well, um, it's too late. They closed the uh, applications over a month ago. And besides, uh, they have about seven or eight applications for every one that they accept. So uh, you're, you're just too late. You have to wait till next year. So we thought about that and we got a room to stay overnight. And the next morning we, uh, visited uh, the nun friend and returned the two books, and then the uh, nun suggested that we go down to the grotto, <laughs> make a visit. So we did so, and uh, as we uh, were leaving, we decided to go up through the uh, administration building and, and go out that way to the parking lot to get in our car. Well, we got uh, in the, in, inside the administration building, and there was the registrar's office, but it was closed because it was Saturday, but the side door was open. And uh, so uh, we knocked on the door, and uh, the registrar himself was there uh, checking the registrations. And so my father introduced me. <laughs> and he said, my son Vince, he's going to school here. <laughs> I love Dad. Dad's a big booster for you. That's terrific. Yeah. So anyhow, uh, Dad, uh, the registrar says, well, uh, your last name? And my dad says, Drenovich. And he says, you know, I've been through this list a lot of times. So I don't recall any name like that. And uh, he says, I don't think he's on this list. And my dad says, I know. He hasn't applied yet. To give him an application. And uh, the registrar, who was a priest, uh, was kind of uh, taken back on this. And he looks at me and, and he said to me, um, what did you score on the college entrance test? And in all my wisdom and preparation, I said, what is that? I love it. So anyhow, my, <laughs> my father says, give him the application for that too. <laughs> so uh, it turned out that I had uh, one chance to take that test the following Saturday. And so he did give us applications for both uh, Notre Dame and for at, that. At home, though, now up there. The uh, college entrance at home? At home, oh, yes. Sure. yes. So what I did was to uh, fill out the application and hand it to him. We went to the post office, filled out the application for the college entrance test to take it at home, mailed it there. And uh, the next Saturday I took the test and May 1st we got a letter. <laughs> so uh, saying welcome to Notre Dame for the glasses. So my dad was right. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And it turns out that um, I, uh, three of my brothers after me went to Notre Dame. Okay. And, uh, Who we, it was Father Hesburgh was president? Father there? Hesburgh was president right. at that time, yes. You know Father Hesburgh holds the award for the most honorary doctors. Over 100, isn't it? At, oh, more, more than that, of any living person today. Yes, and that's yes, incredible. Yeah, yeah. I, know. I, right. I know that. And... Uh, we, uh, well, then your diploma was signed by Hesper just yes, like that. Yes. Is yours the, the parchment like uh, Jim has? His is a parchment with all the, the uh, signatures, it's all original. Yes. And he has it framed. Yeah. Isn't that yeah, great? Yes. Oh. I don't have mine framed, but it's, it's original uh, and signed. So that was a, uh, a 
an experience there. Uh, so my brother, a year and a half younger than I, also went through civil engineering at Notre Dame. And then uh, three years later, another brother came in as a, an architecture, got an architecture degree. And then finally, uh, about five years later, uh, my brother Raymond came in, got a chemical engineering degree. So we have four, four boys okay. who graduated from Notre Dame. And they always tease you with the IU Purdue game. Where are we going with that? Yeah, <laughs> IU Notre Dame, right? Yeah, I, uh, no, Dame. I, I root Purdue for Notre Purdue. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the uh, so anyhow. Um, what was the campus like? In, in it was days? much simpler than it is today. Of course, no, there were no girls. It was all no, 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 no girls. Yes. Right. St. Mary's existed though across yes, the street. Yes, they did. They did, and uh, St. Mary's was a. Uh, uh, and then, you know, because they had about that time about 5,000 male students and the uh, St. Mary's was very small, uh, less than 1,000, I think. So sure. they uh, had deals with Mundelein and some of the other schools in Chicago that they would bust them in for mixers and sure. uh, special events and things like that. So it was a, a good... Uh, what was your first impression in walking into the stadium? Well, uh, I had not been a big sports fan before, and so uh, it was overwhelming, I guess, to say the least. And, uh, <laughs> I felt that way, too, yes. in Ross <laughs> Yeah. The uh, thing is that when you have a school uh, and with that intensity, uh, and the thing that I haven't seen it since then, that on football Saturdays at that time, they locked the dormitories because it was expected that everybody was going to be at the stadium. Uh, and the tickets were part of your tuition at that time. And so uh, it, nobody stayed in the dormitory. Everybody went to the game. That was just expected. Wow. So uh, Interesting. Uh, you don't find that kind of participation here at Purdue or any other place, I don't think. So no, not different. Not, yeah, maybe, maybe the military academies might be uh, something sure. similar to that. That grotto is quite nice, isn't yes, it? Yes, it, is. it still is. It hasn't right. changed at all. Right, and, it's, and it's the, very, the church is magnificent. Yes, there. and of course it's been redone, and it, the Golden Dome's been replated sure. several times since uh, I right. graduated from there. Right. So those, uh, the, the one other thing about Notre Dame that uh, was very special, uh, in my sophomore year, between my freshman and sophomore year, we were put into a surveying class uh, that we had to take. It was a six-week summer course, and then we were putting in into a group. Sounds like the Ross Camp that they yes, used to have. Yes, it, it used to be uh, very similar to Ross Camp, and I was in a group called Party Five because we had Locker Five. There were four of us in that party. and. Um, that uh, experience uh, formed uh, relationships among the four of us that have endured to this day. Uh, we get together frequently. Uh, for example, my retirement party, two of the four were here, or three of the four, including myself, came, one from California, one from the East Coast, to be here for the uh, party. Nice. Uh, we were in each other's weddings, and uh, so the... Kept in touch all these years. All these years, nice. yes. Just like uh, it, uh, we've never... Uh, uh, missed each other or, or uh, like their family and that's sure. that's the closest way where, to where was the, where did you go in the summer was it right there on campus it was right on campus oh, I see. Uh, okay. it was mostly uh, on a farmer's uh, field they had uh, rented a farmer's field to do the work uh, 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 or a large farming area and then the, that was really fun too the uh, it was really hot and sweaty and bugs all over the place but uh, the farmer's wife did the cooking for us, and we ate like we wouldn't believe. Boy, you lucked out. <laughs> Lucky we couldn't. It's like yeah. the uh, plowshearing and whatever, yeah, you know. Yeah, right. So it was really a, a wonderful experience. Well, anyhow, uh, I went through Notre Dame and uh, was ready to go back to um, work with my father and grandfather again. And the department head there, uh, Dr. Harry Sachs, uh, said to me, um, Vince, uh, I've got a research project uh, with the U.S. Air Force to build a special test device, I'd like you to work on it with me or for me, uh, and uh, you can work on a master's degree, and uh, I'll pay you uh, as, with a, fel a research assistantship. And I said to him, "Pay me to go to school." <laughs> so I said, it's a "Deal." So I stayed on, and uh, the summer I. Uh, was an uh, instructor in the, assistant instructor in the surveying camp, the same one I took three years earlier. And then in the fall, I started in the master's degree and uh, working on that research. 
which was a wonderful experience. And my roommate of uh, three years and in graduate school, who was one of the Party Five members, uh, also did a master's degree with me. Uh, we then, uh, he finished up and took a job with the Navy Civil Engineering Corps in uh, Port Wainimi, California. And uh, I was finishing up, this is December <laughs> of my, uh, I was going to graduate in January, so December, and Harry Sachs says to me, you know, you really ought to go for a PhD degree. <laughs> you got a lot of people looking here, looking your over for you, right? So anyhow, he said to me, uh, the only place to study is at the University of Michigan under F.E. Richard, Jr. He's the engineer's engineer. And so I said, well, that sounds interesting. So I wrote a letter to Professor Richard and said, I'm interested in coming there to graduate school. And I'd like to come up and make a visit. Uh, and this is uh, late November, early December. And I could come up in the next week. And I got a call back from him says, come on up uh, and spend the day with us. So I drove up from South Bend to Ann Arbor. Met him in the morning. And he was the department head at the time. And uh, talked with him for a while. And then he said, uh, he arranged for me to tour the laboratories in the campus. And at the end of the day, I went back and visited with him. And he said, well, what do you think? Are you interested in coming here? And I says, well, I've got to get accepted first. <laughs> he says, you're accepted. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm coming. <laughs> oh, wow. You've got a great life. It's, it's all gotten better. <laughs> yeah. What was your impression, though, compared to South Bend? That well, it was, I, it was bigger, though. Oh, it was bigger, much yeah. larger. A factor of five larger, six larger, something like that. And my impression, well, when leaving Notre Dame, I felt that there was just no place in the world like Notre Dame in terms of uh, the people, the atmosphere, and what have you. But when I got to Michigan, uh, I found out that there are other nice people as well, <laughs> and particularly in the civil engineering uh, department up there. Uh, I uh, established a number of friendships, and the relationships with the faculty was just phenomenal. And so I went through and uh, finished my doctorate at the uh, uh, University of Michigan, and then uh, I graduated in, well, Something else happened along the line. Uh, I met Roxanne. I was going to ask you if you were married. Yeah, no, I was not married no. at that time. And then uh, you met her there, Michigan. In uh, Michigan, and uh, that's a, also a very good story. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Roxanne uh, studied at Michigan. She did her undergraduate work in uh, at Russell Sage College in Troy, New York, and then came to Michigan to do a master's in chemistry, organic chemistry, and she finished her degree and was working as a research chemist for what was then Park Davis in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And she and her roommate, uh, Margaret, uh, lived in a duplex, and the uh, other person on the other side of the duplex was a, a divorcee uh, chemist about 15 years uh, their senior. Uh, his name was Art Spang, and uh, he liked the girls and always invited them over for parties and what have you. And uh, one day they made a mistake <laughs> of saying to him, you know, Art, we're both Catholic, and uh, you seem to have only Jewish friends that you invite to your parties, don't you know, the Catholic guys. So <laughs> Art says, well, I'll think about that. Well, the next, <laughs> next day he had his secretary go down to the newspaper, the, the Michigan Daily, which is the counterpart to our exponent, and put in an ad, wanted Catholic young gentlemen to meet two cultured <laughs> 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 young women. <laughs> so anyhow. That's before all this. Yeah, oh, yeah, really none of this. Oh, this this was right, unheard of. Yeah. So uh, the. Uh, Probably got a special if you run it for a week or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I had just come back from uh, uh, final exam in advanced calculus and was uh, really uh, trying to unwind. And so I was just reading the newspaper column by column, and I saw this and showed it to the rest of the st students in the uh, office there. And I said, well, if those girls are gutsy enough to put an ad in, at least I could do is respond to it. In the meantime, the girls saw the ad, but they had no idea it was for them. And so uh, because it was reply, it said, uh, wanted Catholic young gentlemen between 24 and 28 years of age to meet uh, cultured, attractive, uh, Catholic women, uh, please send uh, information and photograph to Box 120, uh, care of the newspaper. So uh, they, uh, about a week went by, and then Art called the girls, and he says, uh, hi, girls, this is Art. Uh, invite me over for a drink. And 
So they said, all right, Art, you're invited over for a drink. He came over with this manila envelope filled with letters. And he said, here, girls, this is for you. <laughs> now, couldn't you see those girls? Of course, they were furious. But then they said, well, it wouldn't hurt to look at these letters, would it? <laughs> so, <laughs> the ad was for us. Okie dokie. And you got the envelope. Oh, well. Yeah, yeah. You get another drink. Yeah. So anyhow, they started uh, reading the letters. And uh, <laughs> I made the... With uh, the pictures? Yeah, I didn't. In? Some had pictures. One sent a picture of a gorilla, uh, and I, I didn't send a picture. I didn't have one handy, so I just didn't bother sending one. But I did uh, write a, a two or three page note saying that I had graduated from Notre Dame and was studying. There. And uh, believe it or not, uh, one of her first reactions to reading the letter, well, this is a Notre Dame guy. I'm not sure I'm going to trust him. <laughs> so anyhow, she... Uh, Continued on, and I kept on. I uh, mentioned several times that I like sports, and that uh, her roommate just wasn't sportsy at all. And so Roxanne chose to respond to, to my letter, uh, and she did with a, a note trying to explain the situation. And she gave me her phone number. So I, uh, after getting that, uh, called her and arranged to meet at uh, the bulletin board at the Michigan uh, Union. Uh, across from the coffee shop uh, at 7.30 on Tuesday night. Well, of course, 7.25 I was there and no Roxanne. 7.30 comes and 7.33 or 34 in comes Roxanne. And her theory was she wasn't going to be on time. If she liked what she saw, fine. If she did, she'd keep on going. <laughs> so <laughs> Others have tried that play, too. Yeah. You know. So anyhow, um, I... Uh, she said, do you like to read ads? And I said, are you Roxanne? She says, yes. And I said, how would you like a cup of coffee? I said, I'm Vince, and I, how would you like a cup of coffee? She said, I'd like that. And so she did about face to go into the coffee shop, and I kind of looked over from head to toe, and I said, you're going to marry that woman. Right off the bat. Right off the bat. Right. took me about six months to convince her that that was the case. Uh, and uh, a year and three months after we first met, we were married. And married in Ann Arbor, St. Mary's. Uh, uh, where, is she, where is she originally? She's, she's from, from New York State, oh, okay. uh, near Poughkeepsie. Oh, okay. So uh, we were married in Ann Arbor, a very nice wedding, and then uh, had a nice uh, apartment there. Uh, we uh, were married, and about a year later, I finished my degree, and uh, we took uh, a job at the University of Kentucky in Lexington, Kentucky. and. That again was kind of a fixed deal in that I had offers from a number of institutions, but one of the uh, uh, persons at the University of Kentucky who was looking to work with me had had the same major professor, F.E. Richard Jr., and so uh, and he was absolutely a brilliant person, and so I felt that that was a good deal for me to go down there and work with him to really learn what there is to learn about uh, teaching and research and, and other kinds of things. Good combination. So a good combination. We made a fantastic team. Uh, I was at the University of Kentucky for 24 years. You had uh, several positions while you were there. Yes, too. I started uh -huh. out at the bottom rung as an assistant what professor. What was it like when you went down into campus? Oh, it was nice. Uh, the Lexington area was, was very nice, except that at that time it still had a lot of tobacco warehouses and other uh, areas that were uh, not very nice. Uh, the campus itself was relatively nice and then of course like all campuses they're building like crazy and you have a hard time recognizing uh, the place today except for a few landmarks. Well I went through uh, the ranks down there. Uh, it was a good place to be uh, and the uh, when I, I became full professor at age 39, which was, uh, I can remember, I, did, I never worried about that stuff. I just had fun. <laughs> right, right. And it comes, it, it makes it all easier. Yeah, you know? yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm not sure I, it would be so much fun today with... It's changed well, a lot. It, it's, it's quite a bit different. And right. so, uh, but then I became the, uh, I guess the, several months after I became full professor, I was named the department chairman. And I had uh, the chair of the department for four years. It was rotating chairmanship. I was offered a second term, and I decided against it because I felt that I was still too young to 
commit myself to administration uh, forevermore. And uh, so uh, it moved on to another person. And I stepped down for, I was down, uh, down for about two years, and then the dean of engineering left to go to the National Science Foundation. And the, uh, it was interesting in that the uh, provost uh, called me and said, would you be the acting dean for a year? And so I was only 44 at the time, 45 maybe, and uh, I thought about it and he said, uh, it's only for a year, and I said, okay. And then uh, I took the job and did okay in it, uh, or reasonably well, and it turned out that they had a full-fledged dean search. While you were the acting dean? While I was the acting dean, and I ended up being uh, one of the two finalists for the permanent job. Uh, so that was interesting, but uh, I didn't get the job. Uh, and in fact, it was uh, Tom Lester, who happens to be a Purdue mechanical graduate, uh, got the job and is still dean there today, and he's still a very good friend of mine. Uh, the re primary reason that I didn't get the job uh, was that the upper administration didn't like me. Uh, I had done some things that I shouldn't have done. Well, the, yes. to yes. give you, their eyes vary. Yeah, yeah. and and the uh, uh, ex example of that, and to this day, uh, people are very pleased. I did what I did. Uh, the uh, we wanted to have a new civil engineering building, and it was civil engineering was just all over the place in closets. One one lab was behind a men's restroom. Uh, it was really uh, didn't have your own shop. No, and the whole. Uh, department was that way, just split up and uh, yeah, all over the place. And so I had a faculty member uh, while I was dean write a proposal for a new civil engineering building, and, and he did. And we submitted it up to the university administration, and we found out that uh, the university submitted it to the state uh, council on higher education uh, as their seventh priority for a new building. Uh, and this council looks at all the state universities and makes recommendations to the legislature for funding. Well, by that time, most of my students were now involved in professional activities uh, throughout the state, and uh, I kind of visited with them, and they said, we need a new civil engineering building. And so they uh, uh, recognized this uh, a little on, and they had a, one of their members put on the Council on Higher Education, uh, just to make sure that uh, our voices were heard. And then uh, I got a call from him one day, and he said, Vince, the Council on Higher Education is meeting this coming Wednesday in downtown Lexington. They'll be finished about 3 o'clock. If you had a bus there around 3 o'clock, we could take the uh, council members to see your present facilities in civil engineering. So I was there with a the bus, and I took and showed them to them. And then uh, that was, uh, I guess, in probably about March or so. And uh, they said, yeah, you really do need a new civil engineering. This is terrible. So anyhow, I didn't hear much about it, anything. And then uh, about a month later, they made their recommendation, recommendation to the state legislature that the number one priority in the entire state was the civil <laughs> So the president and the provost were not very pleased. <laughs> I didn't get the job, but we got a new civil engineering building. <laughs> the end justifies the means, right? right? Exactly. In that case, there, yes. Yeah. And, I, and so, uh, the uh, and when I retired uh, last week, uh, one of the faculty members from down there, uh, and in fact another person as well, sent me letters. Uh, with a picture of the building in it, and said thanks. <laughs> this is yours. This yeah. is yours, right? <laughs> so uh, uh, I was there, and uh, the uh, I was happy. I was back and doing research after the the dean's position, and it turned out that uh, again it was wonderful that I didn't get the dean's job there because uh, there was a tremendous downturn in the economy in Lexington at the in Kentucky at that time, the state legislature. And they cut back tremendously. I had a lot of 15 or 20 percent cutback to the university in terms of funds. And the new dean had to let a lot of people go. 
and that would have been tough for me because I grew up with those people. Sure. And oh, so how about the building? Did that move ahead, though? The building went ahead, oh, yes. Okay. The building was, that was paid for, and uh, that was... Uh, Did you have to do any fundraising for that, or was it... I was gone by that time. Oh, okay, okay. All right. But the But there uh, was and, some and, private and, and, and the... Uh, there were some private funds, but most of it was appropriated by the legislature, $11 million for that building, and uh, it covered about 95% or oh, 90% great. of it. So very it, good. Yes. Right. So we were, we were very fortunate there. Um, but then, uh, so I was there, and then I uh, got a call from Dean Henry Yang here at uh, College of Engineering saying, uh, we'd like you to apply for the position of the head of civil engineering. And uh, he said, uh, why don't you just come up? And I said, well, I'm not interested. I'm happy here. I'm doing good stuff. And he said, well, why don't you come up and take a look around? And so uh, I had a daughter who was in the process of uh, looking for colleges at the time. And we'd gone to look at Duke and Virginia Tech and Emory University in Atlanta and a couple of other schools. And uh, she was thinking in terms of applying at Purdue and at Notre Dame uh, in the area of biology. And so I said, well, let's, let's like go up with us. And so we spent, spent a day or so here. And so uh, she came up, uh, we came up and uh, she went, uh, Henry Yang arranged to have her visit with the dean of the College of Science and then the head of the Department of Biology. And uh, so she got the rural treatment sure. and then uh, well, I visited around, and uh, then at the end of the day, Henry said, well, uh, what do you think? And I said, well, uh, that's a pretty big job, and uh, I'm not sure. He says, well, would you at least consider being a candidate? And I said, well, I guess that would be okay. And that was like in late September. And uh, our daughter, instead of going back with us, went up to South Bend, and my uh, Roommates, uh, one of my Party Five members, his daughter was a senior at Notre Dame at the time, so she, uh, Jenny, camped out with her in her room and oh, uh, visited nice. Notre Dame sure. and uh, uh, yeah, got a chance. Student, that was nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So, uh, and Jenny, as it turns out, uh, was accepted at Notre Dame as well as being accepted at Purdue, and she chose to come to Purdue and she studied biology. So. Uh, she always tells people that uh, Purdue accepted her before they accepted <laughs> her dad. <laughs> so, so anyhow, I got back and it was, and Henry Yang, uh, you knew him and uh, the kind of character he was. He uh, was a very persistent person and had all kinds of uh, endless energy and worked, it seems, 24 hours a day. But I remember it was uh, Thanksgiving evening about nine o'clock at night, he called me at home to try to talk me into the position of coming up here as head of the school. And it was uh, 10.30 or so, and I finally said okay, and uh, gave him a verbal okay uh, to come up here as head of the school. And uh, so uh, I said that it would be July 1st as soon as I can get there. I have a lot of things to do in Lexington beforehand. so. Uh, that the deal was it. So we came up and uh, became, uh, I became head on the uh, 1st of July. We actually we came up uh, a little bit early, like the 20th of June. Uh, there was a, uh, we had bought a house, the same house we're living in right now, but it wasn't ready for us yet. And um, I was, uh, had an NSF sponsored uh, outreach program for local uh, junior high kids. Uh, in Lexington, and that was the last day. It was like a f Friday night. We had a banquet, and uh, all the kids and their parents were there. It was a f fun thing. And so the banquet was over, and it was about nine, ten o'clock at night, and uh, we got in, each of us had a car, and started driving to uh, West Lafayette. Got in about two o'clock in the morning and stayed out at the uh, Homewood Suites overnight. And the, Next morning was the uh, civil engineering golf outing, and uh, we made some changes in that. The first thing is they, they called me about a month ahead of time and said, would you like to play in the civil engineering golf outing? And I said, of course Roxanne and I would like to play. Well, it turned out that 
they hadn't invited women to play. <laughs> so they scrambled to get some partners for Roxanne. They had uh, Ellie Sutton and Sue Scholler and uh, one of, oh, a uh, person who was a, a softball coach at the time oh, okay. to, to play uh, in, in a foursome. And uh, so we, we were playing, it was stroke play at that time, it wasn't a scramble or anything like that. And so I uh, was dog tired and uh, they gave me some uh, uh, partners to play with uh, who were really wonderful people. Joe Wheeling was one of them. Joe passed away about 10 years ago or so. Yeah. Uh, he and his wife Isabel were very good friends of ours after we came. And then, uh, uh, who else? There was uh, Dick Albright, who was uh, from uh, La, uh, Indianapolis. He was uh, an alumnus, a very strong supporter. And, uh, then we had one more person who was uh, a uh, technician in the uh, surveying area. I can't think of his name right now. Um, but uh, so we played around. Dick Albright was a horrible golfer. He was my cart mate, and he shot 175. And so, despite that, and we were playing what, on the, what was the old North course, uh, I shot an 80 scratch, uh, and I won the thing. <laughs> so everyone said that the new boss is in town. <laughs> be ready. Yeah, be ready. <laughs> so uh, immediately after that, we started, we decided that uh, that CE Open was just too much, and it needed to really be open, and so, uh, I asked Roxanne if she wouldn't be on the committee, and then we opened it up to all the alumni who could get here and students as well. And so now, uh, since that time, it's been open. Sure. And this last one, which was the 50th CE Open, uh, we had 140 people play, and we used both the Campin and the Ackerman courses. Very good. And uh, it was my chance to go out in style as well, and so. Um, Roxanne and I and two undergraduate students from my class who were graduating uh, were on the team, and we came in second, so it wasn't so Good. bad. <laughs> that's a nice way. Yes, yeah, nice way, yes, right. yes. So that's uh, some of the things that happened. And with regard to uh, civil engineering, uh, that was a tough group to come into, and there was a long history of uh, difficulties, I'll say, within the school, and in fact, Several people outside the school were taking bets that I wouldn't last six months in the job, uh, mainly because I came from the outside and I was actually the, about the first or maybe the second person that came from outside to be a school head. And the first person lasted several months and then uh, was no longer head. Did some, it wasn't civil engineering, it was another area. And so, uh, but uh, I managed to endure for about nine years. Uh, and did a number of things differently from what had been done before. Uh, the first thing I think I did was to uh, make uh, inroads with our alumni. Uh, I established a, a development director for the school. It hadn't had one, and none of the other schools had one. This was before Blackwell and all the whole. Oh, way before, before this. 1991. Yeah, right. All, all different. All different. Yes. Right. In fact, uh, Margaret. So you got Vision 21. Was I was ahead of that. Okay. Oh, right. So we were already in, sure. uh, I established the Civil Engineering Advisory Council, which was a group of alumni, about uh, 10 to 15, would meet twice a year with us to advise us on things. And uh, that was, had not established before, uh, been established before. And that turned out to be a real boon to us to have mm -hmm. communication with key alumni. Uh, the first uh, semester I was here, we had a faculty retreat and I took all the faculty on a retreat, and it was a chance to uh, brainstorm with them, and they found out a little bit of who I was, and I found a, lot, a little bit more about them in the process, and so that was a good thing, and that continues to this day. So uh, the, on, on the development side, uh, we had an administrative director, uh, Harold Michael, my predecessor, and I made her the first development person, was Margarita Contrini, and she did a masterful job of getting that started. Yeah, and and she's now owner of CEE. Uh, uh, Electrical Engineering. ECE, yes. All right. And uh, we did some really neat things. Uh, for example, uh, 
uh, we went after a Kresge Challenge Grant, which was, yeah, was really, really tough, right. and uh, we got it, which uh, we had to put, uh, have $500,000 in direct donations and $2 million in an endowment before they would uh, consider us. And then after we did that, they matched the 500000 with another 500000 And then we have had, a, had to have a whole system in place where those funds could be used continually over the years to maintain uh, teaching and, uh, within the school. And they exist. We have the Kresge uh, grants, which every year uh, sponsor about $100,000 worth of uh, research for the labs predominantly, undergraduate labs. And so that didn't exist before, and it, it continues to this day. So that was another thing. Um, I uh, spent a lot of time out visiting with alumni and would have, uh, and I thought it was just kind of a nice thing to do, to go out and visit with them. And every year we'd make three or four or five trips. We'd go to California and hit three cities and have dinner with uh, small groups of alumni. Uh, we'd go to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, Houston, Texas. We went uh, every year, Atlanta. Uh, and then we went east to uh, different cities uh, and even places like Cincinnati to visit with alumni. Uh, and just made good friends wherever we went. And it turned out that uh, many of those friendships have been tremendously enduring. Right. The regional uh, thing, and it means a lot, interacting with them. Yes, so the, yes. Oh, I tell them level. stories and they tell me stories That's and right, exactly. <laughs> have a few a drinks and have dinner and right. uh, go on our way. And they feel closer. Oh, they, they really feel are. very close. And, the, uh, and it turns out that a lot of those uh, relationships endure to this day. For example, uh, last Sunday, Bob and Terry Bowen and Roxanne and I played golf at their club. Uh, and uh, we've uh, been close friends for their, with them for a long time and travel with them, play golf with them, uh, visit with them at their place in Florida. And so we're part of the family. Yeah. And, uh, and that holds true for a number of other alums sure. that way. And it turns out that uh, at my graduation or my uh, retirement party, that was the kind of a message that came back that uh, th that hadn't happened before, where people, where the school had went out and uh, reached out to alums and made uh, nice positive thing. relationships. And so I think that that's probably one of the most enduring uh, legacies that I have to the school. And it really paved the way for uh, a lot of things that happened after I stepped down as head of the school. Sure. Right. So that was. Uh, a, uh, a very good thing. Did you uh, increase the faculty do, during that time? Uh, I, I, well, yes and no. Okay. Um, the uh, total numbers didn't change very much at all, maybe up two or three. Uh -huh. But in the nine years I was head, I hired 33 faculty. And over 25 of them are still here today. Uh, so that was a lot of hiring yeah. to do. And then going through the promotion process was a really a big challenge uh, for the school. And, and for me at that time. Uh, so that was uh, a good thing. So we, the, I was head at the time when most of the faculty who were on were, you know, post-World War II faculty were retiring, and so there were a lot of vacancies created that way. Uh, there were others, and uh, to my dismay, some of them were superstars, but we couldn't hold them here, and they went off to Berkeley or Georgia Tech, and uh, particularly Georgia Tech was in our back pocket uh, big time in terms of stealing faculty, but we're still in a good relationship with them and the faculty there, so uh, I didn't feel too bad about it. We just call them Purdue South, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice way of doing it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, do you want to just make a couple comments on your research that you oh, involved in? Okay. Um, yes. Uh, my original research was in soil dynamics, looking at the dynamic properties of soils uh, as uh, might be affected by uh, machine foundation vibrations, earthquakes, and things of that nature. Uh, and as part of my research, I developed and patented some equipment to test the vibratory behavior of soils. Uh, and then uh, I uh, have a company which manufactures equipment, and that company's called Soil Dynamics Instruments, and the, the company's now We've had it since 1973, and it was actually started by Bobby Harden, my colleague at Kentucky, who uh, started about five years be, uh, 
just before I got to Kentucky, and then he became department head before I was department head and didn't want anything to do with the company anymore. So I bought him out, and my wife and I run the company and have since 1973. Mm -hmm. Is it located down in Kentucky? No, it's located here. It's oh. in our basement. Oh. Okay. 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 Uh, and we basically farm out uh, the manufacture of the equipment. And uh, in my spare time, I uh, and I haven't done much in the last five years or so, but I would uh, assemble and calibrate the equipment in my basement and ship it out. And we have uh, about 100 units, and they're all over the world. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Tsinghua University in China has one, there's Shanghai, Australia, uh, Hong Kong, uh, where else, uh, Shanghai, uh, we have uh, in Europe, uh, Scandinavia, India, places like that, so it's, it's pretty good distribution, pretty global. global distribution. Yeah. And the equipment's still working to this day. I would get a call every so often or a, an email saying, uh, would you have a spare part for this piece here? And <laughs> we're still testing it at the Norwegian Geotechnical Institute, which is one of the premier uh, laboratories in the world. They have two of them, and they tell me that it's the busiest piece of equipment in their laboratory. Oh, that's great. That's and, nice to hear. And so, uh, and then I'm uh, a consultant to them now to upgrade the software for it. So I'm going to be doing, that's one of the things I'll be doing this summer. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, my research and that kind of continued while I was here uh, and then uh, in the early 1990s I saw a paper in a journal about time domain reflectometry which is use of electromagnetic waves to determine the water content of soils and I looked at that uh, and I said there's a lot more information in there than they're getting out of the and so I started research on that mm -hmm. Uh, in the 1990s, mid-1990s, I've had uh, five, soon to be six doctoral students complete their research on that. Uh, we have six U.S. patents on the process, and the uh, technology has an ASTM standard, uh, and uh, it's won for us a, a number of awards. Uh, it's licensed to a firm in uh, Georgia, and it's in production and on in s for sale worldwide right now. So, and in fact, before coming over here, I'm working on the next generation of the uh, software for that, uh, the calibrations, uh, to make it even more uh, practical and reliable than it is at the sure. present time. So okay. that and that will keep me busy. Uh, it's stuff on the back burner here that needs to be done. The so that uh, has been uh, really fun and. We ca it's called time domain reflectometry, and the uh, we hosted a an international uh, symposium here in 2006, TDR 2006, and we had people from 38 countries come to participate in our uh, symposium, and it was really fun. And the names that uh, are classic in all of the literature associated with this technology were here. And they're now personal friends. That's very good. That's <laughs> yeah. very good. Yeah. So that's uh, uh, yeah, basically the research. Yeah. Yes. Then after you stepped down, then you went back to teaching and teaching. Reach. Yes, and I and did. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, the, uh, the I while I was head of the school, I was very keenly observing uh, our capstone civil engineering design course. Uh, the curriculum in civil engineering was had a major revision back in 1962, uh, and this course was put in at that time, and it had been taught at that time as a uh, project-type course. And I watched the way the course was being taught and participated in it to uh, look at the presentations, and uh, uh, pitched in a little bit, but not much uh, with regard to the course, and I thought it could be done better. and. The thing that I didn't like is that it's a capstone course, which means it's supposed to pull everything together. Well, the project did, but they had you know five or six students on a team, and as soon as they got this team together, they said, you're doing the structures, you're doing the environmental, you're doing the geotech, you're doing uh, the hydraulics. And so these kids were just doing the stuff and never getting to see the overall project put together. And so... Uh, they were doing just the segments of it. Segments of it, and sure. could, could, wouldn't get the overall 
picture of, of what it was done, and they didn't get much in terms of the estimating, scheduling, and how you go about getting a job to begin with. And so, uh, and I made suggestions, but of course, who listens to the school head when you make suggestions like that? So uh, I stepped down in uh, June of 2000 and went on sabbatical at Carnegie Mellon University and had an absolutely wonderful experience there. And still I'm close to the people on the faculty. I came back in January and uh, they said to me, guess who is teaching senior design this spring? <laughs> I said, wonderful. And so I've taught it every spring for the last 10 years. And in the process, I finally got it. Uh, I started almost immediately making it the way I wanted it to, sure. but I've been refining it ever since. And uh, we have uh, three and soon to be four uh, publications on the course. Uh, in the American Society for Engineering Education. Uh, it is uh, clearly our signature course uh, at the university and uh, or in civil engineering. Uh, and students come out of there with the appreciation of the whole project and what it takes. And to give you a, an idea, I do uh, start off with uh, issuing an RFP to them, and that guides the entire semester, a request for proposals. And so uh, they're and I form the teams and I use an optimization process in forming the teams so they have all the skills that they need. Uh, we have the Olson Lab, which is part of the Kresge Challenge, which is dedicated to senior design. And then we have uh, access to lots of people from the engineering practice community who come in, share their, not only share their ideas, but they help us in the uh, process of reviewing the proposals and reviewing the presentations, et cetera. Uh, about four years ago, I introduced LEAD, the uh, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, and uh, that is uh, something that's being very hot now, and uh, every student should have that coming out of at least civil engineering, um, and, but it, it's only now being done in, in the senior design course. So uh, with that, uh, I felt that the students, and, and by the way, the students coming out of the course while they're in the course, they don't like it because they work so awfully hard, and uh, I, I get uh, much more out of them than they're willing to give. <laughs> mm -hmm. But nonetheless, afterwards they say, wow, what a course. And uh, at graduation, I could hear uh, them in the, in the reviews and say, this is the best course I ever had, or this is, uh, uh, was worth all the effort. <laughs> Not that it's ruined. <laughs> yeah. So that's the uh, course, and uh, I decided that since I'm so passionate about it, I got to do something about that. So, one of the things that Roxanne and I did is that we uh, visited with uh, Gordon Shavers in the uh, University Development Office and uh, established an endowment for that course. So, the senior design course now at Purdue is the first endowed course at the university. Uh, and we put in, uh, so we started the endowment with a small minimum amount, but then we put in uh, a uh, trust fund that uh, upon our, our demise it will be handsomely uh, funded uh, so uh, and students in the future will have the opportunity to continue to get uh, a good experience in senior design so that's uh, a passion uh, I've taught as well the soil mechanics and soil dynamics courses and had a lot of fun in that I've had a number of very uh, wonderful graduate students as well as undergraduates coming out of the program that are uh, still very close. Uh, several of my graduate students came from very far and others who couldn't come sent videos to me yes. for the retirement uh, celebration so that was very nice. Tell us a little about that for the researchers. How did that come about? The, the dinner. The, the dinner. dinner. Oh yeah. well that was a uh, you know. You knew it was coming. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, one of the things I did in uh, 2003 was to uh, take a leadership role with our colleagues in forming the Purdue Geotechnical Society. Uh, and this was a society of faculty and alumni who were interested in geotechnics uh, to get together for a one-day workshop. And then that workshop would uh, have, at the end of the workshop, uh, the G.A. Leonard's Lecture. Jerry Leonard's was a very famous member of our yeah. faculty here and uh, did the work on the pizza thing after yes the tower. pizza tower right. that's correct yeah. right. and so uh, in honor of him we created the GA Leonard's lecture and we've had uh, we this is the eighth year that we've had it and uh, 
the uh, it's been a fantastic success. Uh, doesn't make much money, barely breaks even, but the success in terms of having people back and participate is it just. It keeps his name up the front. It keeps him up right. in the front. Well, last October, my colleagues informed me at lunch one day that I was no longer in charge, <laughs> and then slowly they. Uh, told me that they were dedicating the uh, workshop this That's year to me. I saw that. I was going to yeah. ask you about that. So, That's very nice. And so it, it was, the theme was making waves, which is kind of a uh, thing that I'd done all my life. <laughs> and so uh, the uh, people on the program were either colleagues of mine, uh, teachers of mine, or uh, students of mine. And it was a phenomenal day uh, in terms of the workshop. Uh, the Leonard's lecture, the eighth Leonard's lecture, was given by Richard D. Woods. Richard Woods uh, was my big, big brother at Notre Dame days. While I was a senior, he was finishing his master's degree, and we teamed up on a project together. It was a total failure, but we got to be good friends. And then when I showed up at Michigan, he showed up a couple of months later, and so we went through the doctoral program together. Uh, and he and his wife, Dixie, were... Uh, very instrumental in helping me court Roxanne while I was there. Uh, they were in our wedding, or he was, and um, the uh, and we've maintained uh, close relationship uh, ever since. He stayed mm -hmm. on at the University of Michigan. I went to Kentucky and then came here to Purdue. Mm -hmm. uh, he became head of the school at Michigan while I was head of the school here at Purdue. So two classmates, yeah, nice. uh, two Big Ten schools, yeah. yeah. And uh, he and his wife Dixie are godparents to our Julie, and so it's a uh, nice nice relationship so they uh, he gave the eighth, eighth GA Leonard's lecture which was very nice and uh, a very difficult problem that he tackled and uh, was well received and then that evening they had uh, a reception and uh, dinner uh, and after the dinner they had a number of people come up and say nice things and that was precious that's very nice. yes super I was going to ask you a couple about your awards one of the ones the most recent is you're getting ASCE distinguished member and you're going to be installed this yes. in October. In October, yes. Congratulations. Yes. Thank you. Very Thank nice. you. And then the workshop you talked about. The other nice thing is that Hardin Durenovich Hwen Professorship of Geotechnical <laughs> Engineering <laughs> at the University of Kentucky. Yes. And it overlaps years over to by 24 years. Yes. The people. That's very nice. Yes. The, uh, well, when I left there, I left in very good uh, uh, relationship with them. I mean, they were proud to see me move on. And I've maintained contacts with them ever since. Uh, when I left, I had 24 years of experience, and I was 51 years of age. And you add those two together, and it comes to 75. And so I was eligible not only to retire from the University of Kentucky, but to obtain emeritus status. So I'm, I have been for the last 19 years professor emeritus at the <laughs> University of Kentucky. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the work of Hardin, uh, Huang, and myself uh, basically put Kentucky on the map in terms of the geotechnical area, and so they thought it would be a, a fitting thing to uh, create a professorship in our honor. And so they did, and it's funded now, and I contributed, of course, to the uh, professorship of the Hardin and Huang, and uh, they're naming the first uh, this coming fall will be named the first Very professor. Nice. In, uh, Very nice. So You've gotten quite a few awards, and I thought the um, University of Kentucky Alumni Association, Great Teacher yeah, Award, yes. were there, and the University of Michigan Alumni Society, and Notre Dame's Engineering Alumni <laughs> Award. See, all the schools, remember, you yeah. made an impact, right? <laughs> I, I didn't burn my bridges. <laughs> <laughs> and the George Wyland Award for Distinguished Service. Yes, in yes. That's nice. Now I want to ask you about the Vinny Leadership Award. That's on the Math Counts. You don't have to share about that. No, it's not Math Counts. That's the Vinny, Vinny Leadership math. Award does exist. Okay. okay. Uh, mid 1990s, uh, there was an organization called Leadership. They still exist. The Leadership, right? Okay. And Leadership was founded out of the University of Illinois, and a group of students <laughs> from Purdue went to a summer week-long workshop uh, Leadership program and came back all enthused about having uh, that program here. Uh, they were told in order for them to be a recognized student organization, they had to have a faculty advisor. And um, 
they went shopping, and it turned out that uh, they knocked on my door when you are faculty advisor. And this was while I was head of the school, so sure. it was. Uh, I was a little reluctant to take on the job, but the importance of leadership was something that was uh, pretty strong in my mind. So I said okay, and so they said you don't have to do anything. We just need somebody to sign the papers. We'll do all the work. <laughs> and so they did. Uh, surprisingly, they raised money. I think they had to raise $45,000 for a week-long workshop. They had uh, 40 students or so in it, and, and then they came to me and said, uh, would you like to come to the workshop? We'd like to invite you to be one of the, uh, and they have, they had two main facilitators for the whole week, and then they have uh, clusters, and the, they needed some cluster facilitators, and so I uh, said, uh, Okay, and it was up at Camp Tecumseh, and it was a nice uh, experience. And so uh, it was tough. Uh, and here I am, I was 55 at the time, and, and including the instructors, the next youngest person was 38. Or, I mean, the next oldest person. So I was clearly out of my own, but, but I, <laughs> you can, you can do I hung in there. And, uh, and it is a very powerful thing. And in fact, uh, after that uh, year, uh, it was in August as I recall, uh, those students came back all fired up and they just absolutely ran everything in engineering on the campus. Uh, I was really impressed and, and Dick Schwartz, I can remember him saying and shaking his head, he said, <laughs> he said that program has done something that really transformed the students into this That's college. Right. And, uh, and so uh, I uh, went uh, to two other two other times, but I didn't stay the full week that time, um, And uh, but I'd go up for the sessions, and uh, one of the sessions, uh, I guess the second year, they decided to uh, create the Vinnie Award, and the re name, reason behind that is that in the cluster group, uh, they were calling me Vinnie, and they could do that, okay, and in fact, that was a code that we had. If I saw any of those students on campus, if they said, hi, Vinnie, I knew that they were leadership graduates, and they had uh, the it rock, rock, code, it's a said. code, yes, and so uh, they decided to create the Vinnie Award, and that was uh, very nice. I don't think they've continued it, and I think what happened, well, uh, to my dismay, um, leadership has kind of fallen apart on the campus here. Uh, it, I think it's in the process of getting resurrected, but it's not there yet, and what happened was that the engineering students, it was predominantly engineering students, and it was really very well run, as engineers might do. But then they decided to open it up to uh, ag and science, and then liberal arts students got involved in it. And um, it got to the point where those people who had the responsibilities for running it didn't take those responsibilities seriously. They didn't raise the funds, they didn't um, put the program together, and it, it dwindled. And that was a tragic loss for the school. I was faculty advisor, I think, for three years, and then someone else took it over uh, because I was uh, getting, you know, I was too busy to give them the service sure. that they needed. But uh, I'd like to see that come back and that would, that really has an impact on people's lives. Yeah, maybe yeah. it will. Sometimes those things get down and then yes. they get yeah, back Yeah, they're, they're cyclic in nature, right. yes. Yeah. And then your professional associations. Um, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? Favorite Purdue tradition? Mm. Well, I've got lots of them. Uh, okay, he can have more than one. Yeah, um, we uh, we like to go to the football games. We're diehard women's basketball fans and uh, enjoy uh, following the ladies' basketball. Uh, uh, the CE Open is very strong in my heart. In fact, I was at a professional society meeting in Indianapolis, gave my presentation snuck away to do the Civil Engineering Golf Open and went back for the uh, evening program that I was involved in. So uh, that's a strong tradition which I, I like. Uh, the uh, Civil Engineering does a number of nice things. They have the, the uh, uh, faculty breakfast for alumni. You do that for homecoming, don't you? Homecoming. They used to do it, first of all, at Gala Week. Then oh. they decided to do it both at Gala Week and at homecoming. Okay. Uh, in the fall, and then I think Gala Week kind of disappeared now, and it's going to be done yeah. only at homecoming. So, but uh, 
that's a, a, a nice thing. That's a long, that's a long tradition. People used to talk about that years yes, ago. Yes, and so. it's really nice. And, yeah. and, and a lot of people like the clinkers will come to that. Uh, uh, and uh, others, uh, when... No, they. It's they, known. It's known. <laughs> yes, it's a good it's place. Known, to, right? Yes, that's right. You can check that out. Right. So those are those are uh, yeah. really good traditions. And uh, so how about an outstanding uh, event? Any event that you? Well, this uh, retirement celebration has to be one that's been exceptionally large in my mind. Um, I was very pleased uh, when we dedicated the Bowen Lab. I thought that was a, a milestone for the school and really put us. Nice. Uh, Great location. Yeah, great location. Uh, super faculty. Uh, the facility is uh, spectacular, and uh, I take a lot of people down there to give them personal tours of the yeah, facility. So I'm very proud of that. Yes. Yeah, good. And, uh, now the next stage. What's going? Tell us in closing, and I'll leave it up to you. Okay. Next stage. Well, next stage is. Uh, I'm always in transition, and I never work. Okay. So. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> so, uh, for example, uh, there are several things. The, I've got a lot of things on the back burner that, that haven't, uh, that need to be published, uh, particularly the TDR stuff. Right. And uh, I'd like to get that into print. And uh, I've got, just today got a message that my ASTM standard for that technology has to be upgraded, and I'm, that's perfect timing, so I will be doing that. You got that. time to devote to it. I got time yeah. to devote to it. Uh, so that's uh, one thing. I'm, I'm still heavily involved in professional and technical activities. Uh, for example, I'm on the State Board of Registration for Licensed Engineers, and tomorrow I'll spend all day in Indianapolis at a board meeting. Uh, I've uh, involved with uh, the Indiana Society of Professional Engineers and in fact just this last weekend they announced to me that uh, the National Society of Professional Engineers has uh, named me the Joseph A. Uh, Rhodes Mentor of the Year so uh, for the whole society. Nice. So, Congratulations, uh, that's nice. So uh, that's uh, caught me by surprise, but <laughs> it's like very well. Those are good surprises. <laughs> yeah. Right. And uh, so I have a strong affiliation with, with the engineers in practice and like to see them uh, bootstrap and, and, and be successful sure. in the process. Uh, so that's one aspect uh, of what I'll be doing. So I'll be uh, spending a day or two here. Uh, the grad students just love me. Uh, because I help them with their stuff in the labs. Uh, when I leave here, I'm going to the lab because a student has a problem. And then uh, just before coming here, another student walked in and he needed to have some special holes cut in a Teflon, and he didn't know how to do it. Well, it wasn't an easy thing to do. So it's I a student contact that you yeah, like to do. Yeah, yeah, right. And I think that will maintain for a while. Then on the other front, uh, my basement at home and my office here at the university are both uh, disasters, I guess, is the best way to describe it. <laughs> we understand. You understand that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Others have the same thing. Yeah. Uh, so I've got to put a plan in place to uh, uh, decumulate, if you will, a lot of things. And I'm thinking in terms of giving most of the books and other things away, keeping maybe some of the papers and uh, research stuff. Uh, and uh, so that's uh, high on the priority list. And then my golf game's atrocious, so I need to work on that. And then finally, and most importantly, uh, I have two grandsons and then a set of twins on the way. So uh, they need uh, me to help them find about the uh, wonders of God's creation. So that's, <laughs> so that's going to be... Uh, that sounds good. Uh, yes, we'll be spending, in fact, Friday morning we're going to... Uh, Champaign, Urbana, Illinois, where two of our grandsons now live. One is a month and a half old, and the other one's uh, going on three. Uh, and so uh, we need to spend a little time with them. We'll just you know, spend the two days and then come on back. Sure. And, and then our daughter in Chicago is having twins in September, so uh, that will take some of our time. time right. Busy time for that's us right. as well, yes. Yeah. Good. So that's the future. I don't think I'm going to get bored. Right? I don't think so. And I really, really appreciate this opportunity. Okay. I really thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Yeah, did, that's did no, I? absolutely great. 